Hi, everyone. Welcome to week six, day two of the 2023 Summer Eco Ambassadors Program. Um, we have a very exciting session planned for today. We started our discussions on SDG 11 uh, and Sustainable Cities on Tuesday and had a really interesting discussion on urbanism uh, and, and the SDGs. And today uh, we're gonna talk a, a little bit about uh, different uh, um, initiatives and projects uh, that use different sources of data uh, to contribute to SDG 11. Uh, so before we get started, it would be great if everyone could introduce themselves and let our guest speakers know where they're joining from. Uh, and I'll start with our regular housekeeping uh, points here. So this session is being recorded. So please don't turn on your video if you're not comfortable being recorded. Uh, please make sure to stay on mute uh, until we start the discussion and Q&A session. Um, and uh, feel free to just add any questions or comments uh, in the chat. Uh, so um, as you all know, this week's theme is focused on sustainable infrastructure and resilient cities. Um, usually I start with a brief uh, presentation, but uh, we have my wonderful colleagues here with us today. So I'm not gonna do any presentations and we're gonna jump right into um, uh, the presentation of our guest speakers. Uh, we have um, um, my colleagues from the eo for sdg uh, initiative. Um, so they'll tell you a little bit about more uh, about uh, the initiative. It's part of the Group on Earth Observation, uh, and uh, the focus is on the use and application of Earth observations for the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and so we also have uh, my colleague, um, Bob Chen uh, from Season. So I think you all might remember James uh, from week two. Um, so he's also uh, um, uh, a member of the Season team. So it's great to also have uh, Bob join us uh, this week uh, as well. Uh, so I think we're gonna start uh, off with um, Julie first, if I'm not mistaken, and then we're gonna hand it over to Bob. Uh, after the presentation, we'll have our um, breakout sessions. So those are five minute sessions where we get to meet uh, someone that's part of the program and have a discussion or ask questions related to the presentations and uh, interact with each other in smaller groups. And then we'll regroup and have kind of a Q&A and discussion session uh, with uh, the, the, the whole group. Uh, so that's the agenda for today. And without further ado, I am going to hand it over to Julie to get us started. Uh, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Great. Julie, the floor is yours. Great, thanks Miriam. And hi everyone. I am so excited to be here today. Um, again, my name is Julie Chamberlain and I'm the program manager for the Sustainable Development Goals at NASA, and as already mentioned, the executive director of the EO for SDG initiative, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about today. And I'm also joined by my colleague, Robert Chin, um, who's going to uh, take the torch from me and talk a little bit more about the Earth Observations Toolkit for Sustainable Cities and Human Settlements, also known as the EO Toolkit which he helped launch in 2021. So that's what we have on the docket. Um, but before we get started, we'd just like to extend a huge congratulations to all of you for being part of this really prestigious summer program um, and just for tackling the issues that are so important to all of us. And thank you for being here today. All right, next slide, please. All right, before we begin, I'd like to provide just a few definitions of some of the key terms we're gonna be using throughout this presentation. Um, as part of the ambassadors program, we know you're familiar with the SDGs, so we'll skip that one. Um, but I'll pause on the second one, which is Earth Observations or EO. You probably already encountered this term, but it's a term that we use a lot. So we wanna work from a shared definition. And so when we use this term, what we are referring to um, are the collection of images and data about our planet, including about our land, oceans, atmosphere, ice, ecosystems, structures, and people that are gathered from a range of platforms, including satellites, aircraft, and drones, um, but also others. 
Another term you might hear today is GIS, which as you also may know, refers to the special software designed to transform, analyze and visualize spatial data, including for making maps. And lastly, another good term to know, and Bob might touch on this in a, in a little bit, is the term human planet. And human planet refers to the efforts to map and analyze how human settlements and activities are distributed across the planet and evolve over time. All right, next slide, please. So I'm gonna kick things off by digging into the program that I help run, which is called the Earth Observations for the Sustainable Development Goals Initiative. And that's a mouthful. So we usually just refer to it as EO for SDG. Now to understand EO for SDG, I'm gonna journey back to 2015. It was a year, as you know, that UN member states passed the 2030 agenda and that the world adopted the 17 SDGs, which came with uh, 169 targets and 241 indicators. Um, so a pressing question that was asked then and that still looms large today for us and one that you've probably also been pondering is how do we accurately measure all of these goals, targets, and indicators? It's a lot. So how do we track progress in a meaningful way? Um, so those behind the 2030 agenda were uh, very aware of these concerns and they understood that data was gonna be a major factor. And in fact, they specifically stated in article 76 of the 2030 agenda, and this quote is um, on the slide, that we will exploit the contribution to be made by a wide range of data, including earth observation and geospatial information. So this is a quote that we constantly re return to as we think about our mission and the role that data and earth observations in particular can play in helping us with the SDGs. So this is where EO for SDG came in. Once the 2030 agenda was approved, Earth observation experts and organizations around the world saw an opportunity to contribute to the SDGs. And this includes the Group on Earth Observations, uh, which is also known as GEO, um, which is a global organization that encompasses hundreds of national governments and partner organizations. So in 2016, GEO um, gave birth to EO for, SD, EO for SDG. And ever since then, our mission has been to serve as a bridge connecting the SDGs and Earth observation experts and organizations. And this is still our primary mission, uh, which is to demonstrate the immense potential of Earth observations and geospatial data and implementing, tracking, and evaluating the SDGs. Um, and one of our, our major goals is to show how EO data can supplement more traditional forms of data the countries usually track to the SDG. So you um, might have been studying this in other sessions, the way uh, that um, other kinds of data like census data, administrative records, household surveys, demographic data um, are important for tracking the SDGs. And our goal is to bring earth observation and geospatial data together in order to provide a more comprehensive, accurate um, picture of our progress towards the SDGs. All right, next slide, please. All right, so you may be wondering, what is it that we actually do? Um, and at the core of our activities is the task of increasing awareness about how exactly Earth observations can help us track, monitor, and assess specific SDGs goals, targets, and indicators. So as you know, there are so many indicators and abundance of data. Um, so this task is really important. Just the, the kind of, the what may, may seem like a somewhat simple task of kind of mapping how earth observations can be important. Um, so uh, EO for SDG, along with many other groups in the past seven years, uh, have been working hard to analyze and map out where earth observations are most relevant to specific targets and indicators. So one example is the chart on your screen. Um, so in the middle, you can see the 17 goals. On the left-hand side, you can see where experts have determined that Earth observations have significant potential to contribute to certain targets. And on the right-hand side are the areas where we think that EO data can have the biggest impact on specific indicators. 
Um, so even from this map, you can see uh, the remarkable range of SDGs where Earth observations can make um, an important contribution. But I want to call attention to four SDGs in particular where we think EO data is valuable. And that's SDG 6, 11, 14, and 15. Um, and just to give you some examples, for SDG 6, which focuses on clean water and sanitation, Earth observations and geospatial data can give us um, really important insights into the availability and quality of water resources. Um, in the case of SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities, EO data is indispensable for monitoring things like urban expansion, tracking changes in land use, and guiding urban development efforts. And um, Bob is going to share more about SDG 11 in the context of our toolkit in a moment. When it comes to SDG 14, life below water, EO data can help us monitor things like ocean temperatures and currents, um, help us track marine species movements, and support overall efforts to protect and uh, restore marine ecosystems. And last but not least, SDG 15, life on land. Um, for SDG 15, EO data helps us observe changes in land cover, track wildlife movements, and overall steer efforts to protect and restore our land ecosystems. So um, just to circle back, um, this has been one of our primary aims at EO for SDG is just helping to demystify these complex relationships. And um, in so doing, we hope to make it easier for others to understand, navigate, and ultimately use Earth observations for sustainable development. All right, next slide, please. Um, so EO for SDG raises awareness in other ways as well. Um, we work with UN bodies, SDG custodian agencies, national statistical offices, geospatial organizations, local governments, and others uh, to develop and promote methodologies and standards for using EO to advance the SDGs. Uh, we contribute to policy briefings and publications like the one pictured um, kind of on the middle left. Um, this is a, a publication that provides detailed information on how Earth observations can be used to track particular targets and indicators. Um, we also conduct capacity building trainings, um, such as a few that we'll mention later on that we've done um, for SDG 11 in the toolkit. And we also showcase outstanding organizations and projects through our annual awards program, which is called the GEO SDG Awards. Uh, so since 2019, we've had um, recognized more than 30 um, winning organizations and projects from all over the world. Um, and the picture here is of some of those winners celebrating last year at our, um, at our gala. Um, so those are all ways that we raise awareness, um, and I'll talk about just a couple more on the next slide. And that is just to quickly say that we know the importance of engaging the public and relevant organizations through our online platform. So um, if you're interested in our website, it's eoforsdg.org, and we share news, reports, uh, blogs from experts. We're actually just getting ready to launch a new um, blog series called Mapping EO and the SDGs. Um, and we also share updates and form connections through Twitter. So if you're on Twitter, we'd love to connect with you. All right, next slide, please. All right, none of this could be done alone. So I'm actually the only full-time employee on EO for SDG um, and we're more of a network. So we rely, I rely on a large number of contributing partners and experts from around the world. And here you'll see a few of them, um, which includes SDSN and SDGs Today, which you're familiar with. And um, we rely on experts like Bob, who you know, knows all you want to know about human settlements, infrastructure, and population. Um, so we just like to take this opportunity to um, you know, raise the importance of SDG 17, which is partnerships for the goals. And we know that we must work together if we want to achieve um, the 2030 agenda and beyond. Okay, um, last but not least, um, I'm gonna share a little bit about 
uh, things we want to keep in mind if we want to realize the full potential of Earth observations and SDGs. So I think eo for sdg and many similar organizations have done a lot of great work, but we have a long way to go. So what do we need to aim for as we move forward? Um, one thing is prompt and frequent access to data. Um, it is crucial for monitoring progress, making informed decisions. So our current systems need to be improved to ensure uh, that data is not just available, but also accessible, um, ideally in real time. Um, additionally, uh, integrating data from various sources, including satellites, airborne, ground-based platforms, it's essential. Um, this is essential for creating more comprehensive information sets. So we need better methods for combining and harmonizing these different types of data. We also need openly accessible and free data in order to maximize its usability and reach. So for this, we really need to overcome a variety of legal, technical, and institutional barriers. Um, collaboration is one that I've already mentioned. We need really strong partnerships between Earth observation and geospatial providers, um, between others kind of UN stakeholders, and um, especially nas national statistical offices. Um, because national statistical offices are usually the ones to report on progress towards the SDGs. So to really realize the full potential, we need um, to coordinate among all these different groups. Um, in the same vein, we need open and continuous dialogue, especially in order to identify gaps, um, test methods um, for measuring the SDGs, and just strengthen our capabilities at all levels. And last but not least, we still need to communicate the value of data for achieving sustainable development. Um, it is not obvious to many people, even some working on the SDGs, that Earth observations can be an essential asset. So these are definitely not insurmountable challenges, and we hope that um, many of you will help us carry the torch. So that's my spiel. Thank you for listening. Um, and Bob, I'll go ahead and um, hand it over to you to talk about one of the major projects that EO for SDG supports alongside many other organizations. Great, thanks, Julie. And uh, up here. Uh, so yeah, that's that's I think a good background both on uh, how EO for SDGs as an initiative got started and uh, what some of its goals and. Uh, visions are. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the other piece of it is how an initiative like this can really connect to uh, user community and help people on the ground uh, make a difference. And um, with that in mind, uh, I think a few years ago, EO for SDG really uh, pursued a direct relationship with uh, the UN agency called UN Habitat and uh, uh, decided to uh, collaborate and, and work with them to address uh, the need for a shared uh, online uh, knowledge resource and, and a portal to different resources. So, you know, one of the problems, not the only problem for people uh, around the world sitting in both large and small cities and settlements is uh, how do they get access to relevant data like data from satellites that they're not necessarily you know, familiar with or trained to use um, and how can they incorporate that into their day-to-day -day, uh, analysis and decision-making. Um, you know, at the same time, uh, cities around the world over the last decade or two have adopted uh, geospatial uh, information system, GISs, uh, for use in urban planning and all sorts of applications. So they are starting to get more familiar with spatial data. And of course, they are, they may be aware of uh, the sustainable development goals. There are quite a few cities that have even tried to uh, develop goals for their own areas, uh, but there's still a big disconnect given, you know, what you heard from Julie, there's so many different 
targets and indicators, it's hard to put it together. And, and of course, not necessarily easy to access uh, the relevant data. Uh, so that that's sort of the goal of uh, the initial goal of this uh, site. It was to, you know, pull together the available Earth observation data uh, that seemed re most relevant to uh, human settlements uh, was to support uh, the SDG 11 uh, community, and in particular, uh, uh, what's called the New Urban Agenda, which is a it's kind of a follow-on initiative led by UN Habitat, and uh, pull in uh, uh, you know different kinds of content, address, try to help users get up to speed on what's doable, and uh, put more. Uh, data and tools at their fingertips. Uh, so you 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 see the link there and and the int uh, the home page. Oops. Um, and and again, I don't have to go over this in detail, but uh, some of the relevant targets eleven one through three and eleven seven, but also others. Uh, you know have this. Uh, component to them that relates to, uh, you know, understanding spatially, not just for the country as a whole, but for specific cities and within cities, uh, what uh, would make them uh, safer, more resilient and sustainable and, and include people who uh, might otherwise be left behind. So, uh, you know, things like uh, uh, providing housing for everyone, but also addressing the the problem of what's generally known as informal settlements, but you know, in the popular terms, is is called a slum. Uh, you know, how what proportion of the urban population lives in those areas, and uh, can we identify and characterize them in order to hopefully improve living conditions and. Uh, uh, assist the people uh, directly in terms of their housing and transportation and related things. Uh, similarly, the uh, issues of both road and public transportation access, also getting at people again who may have uh, difficulties accessing or using certain kinds of services, uh, looking at in the longer run uh, urbanization trends and how uh, countries can better manage that and also uh, uh, you know, match the investments such as in infrastructure to uh, address the future urbanization needs and uh, you know, address other kinds of uh, uh, aspects of urban life like access to open space, uh, which isn't just a quality of life issue can also relate to uh, humanitarian response and the ability to to coordinate and deal with uh, large groups and uh, you know reflects a broader set of, of uh, issues of habitability. Um, so I did want to take one step back because I know the focus has been on there's been a lot of focus on the specific SDGs, uh, but if you're thinking from the viewpoint of an urban planner, uh, SDGs probably isn't on the top of your list. You're much more concerned with the whole range of issues, mostly covered by the SDGs, but potentially extending extending beyond. I mean, every city is concerned about, uh, you know, clean air, good sanitation, access to food and water, energy supplies, housing public facilities, transportation, uh, uh, you know, that's that's basic. And whether or not you're worried about any particular SDG indicator, there's a whole set of systems that have to function for uh, cities to operate. Uh, you know, but thinking about how the public infrastructure and the private infrastructure uh, operates not just for the urban core, but as it extends out to the rural areas, you know, how how is industry and uh, public health and medical activities integrated into uh, 
the city is all part of the sustainability. Uh, certainly uh, thinking about emergency preparedness and disaster response, uh, but also longer term issues of climate change, you know, are all now sort of uh, frontline issues for for urban planners around the world. And being able to have a governance structure and a, a planning and social service, uh, 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 both from government and from private and non-governmental sources is, is really critical. So I, I just want to, you know, I know you've probably discussed this in other uh, sessions, but thinking of it from the urban viewpoint, um, that's really where a lot of these issues come together. and. And need to be integrated um, and so that is sort of my entry point into talking about what you can find in the portal uh, there's a lot of different kinds of data related to how people are using the land um, but also air quality and water quality uh, that uh, uh, earth observations can help identify uh, vegetation and, and changes in vegetation uh, of course, one of the relatively newer ways to observe what people are doing is through uh, the lights they have on at night. It gives you uh, both in the longer run some sense of uh, where people are actually living uh, and working, uh, but also, uh, uh, you know, can in some cases track short term changes, uh, movements of population and that sort of thing. And um, uh, you know, there, there are uh, uh, both environmental and, uh, uh, you know, the, the human part of the planet uh, issues that the data can help characterize, but it has to be put together with other sources of data to be uh, useful. Um, so again, the, back to the portal, uh, it, uh, uh, we've tried to pull available tools and, and recognizing that there are definitely a lot of gaps uh, in you know, trying to cover all the issues I just mentioned, but uh, different groups for different purposes have pulled data sets and tools together. Um, and uh, the, the toolkit hopefully is, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, trying to make it easier for people to get to, but also uh, tries to give examples of uh, how places have successfully used data uh, so that uh, people who aren't familiar get a better sense of, of the utility and, and uh, transferability of those methods and data. Uh, so I'm going to try to um, do a live demo, which is always a little dangerous, uh, but uh, you can still see the the website because I yeah, yeah, great. So again, this is the interface. Let me get rid of all these pictures here so I can see. Um, and uh, you know, again, some of the key issues are highlighted and you can as you scroll down here, get an example of, uh, both the categories of content, but also uh, some highlights of what's been added and um, some news uh, and things that we've tried to feature. Um, you know, uh, as I'll just go through these briefly. Hopefully, you can explore them. Uh, uh, of course, a key component of this is access to data. Uh, most of these are geospatial data sets, which uh, do require uh, generally some familiarity with GIS software, but people can uh, download actual data sets, uh, obviously get documentation and other things. This, uh, link leads you to a site in Italy at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission and is a is a, a set of open and free data which uh, maps uh, as it says human settlements uh, over time 
Uh, of course, this is a fairly technical presentation and uh, is geared to, as I mentioned, the uh, the kinds of users in the city who would be uh, familiar with GIS software and how to use it. Um, uh, this particular set of data was was a collaboration between the European group and, and my center. And uh, it's partly interesting because um, uh, the JRC led an effort to uh, make this data more relevant to what United Nation, uh, the UN community needed. And uh, I'm gonna skip to the tools to try to uh, show you what that need was uh, or relates to. And I'm gonna go down to this tool called City Definition Generator for SDG 11. Um, so one of the, uh, uh, <laughs> it, it kind of layered in a whole bunch of things automatically. Um, but I have to back up. Uh, one of the issues with partly the way the United Nations runs is that when UN agencies collect data from every country, um, uh, the countries are responsible for the data that is provided. I mean, they're they're uh, under a lot of uh, you know they're try they're supposed to follow standards. The national statistical offices collaborate, but uh, they often bring to the table data that they've collected in their own way for for many years or decades. And getting the UN has a challenge trying to get these data as consistent as possible uh, because they can't really, you know, tell a government what to do. Um, they can only encourage it. And interestingly, one of the <laughs> things that has been not as consistent over the years has been how a country defines what is an urban area versus what is a rural area. And many countries have their own definitions. And that means when you have, say, a total population and you, a country reports that 55% is urban and 45% is rural, you don't really know what that means. It's very specific to a country as to what they consider a person living in a urban area or not. Sometimes it's defined by the, just by the administrative boundary or the uh, the name of the place, or sometimes it's defined by uh, the density of population and so forth. So uh, uh, that's been true for, as I said, many decades, uh, but there wasn't a consistent definition of what's urban versus rural, not to replace those local definitions, but to complement them. And uh, uh, the Giant Research Center uh, worked with UN Habitat and others, or the UN Statistics Division and Population Division to come up with a definition that was based on the satellite data, that is how built up is an area from, that you can see from space. And depending on the characteristics of that, that would define a um, what is a consistent urban area or not. And then you count the people through censuses and so forth uh, uh, through that. Um, so, oops. So this is a tool that allows you to actually uh, go through and change the thresholds of what population is and clusters, and then it has some options for Oops, I forgot to generate, pick a year, where'd that go? And uh, oh, yeah, so the it generates this little um, uh, A blue outline that allows you to uh, allows you to kind of see what is the area that is defined. I 
because this is a pretty low density. Um, so that's an uh, interesting little tool that you can play around with that lets you get at some of these uh, changes. So let me back up. Uh, I know in the interest of time, I have to move through this. Uh, another section of the site relates to use cases. Um, they're they're uh, about, these are ones that are specific to particular places that you saw on the map, and each has a um, uh, you know similar structure where someone can take a look at how, in this case, the uh, statistical office for Mexico. Uh, was able to go through and um, look at building density databases to um, create a uh, uh, track urban growth uh, over time in Mexico. And it details a little bit of the technology, but also goes into the impact and uh, inputs and gives people an idea. So. Um, I think those use cases are helpful. There are a number of uh, general documents uh, that uh, were developed under this project, as well as uh, training uh, courses that uh, were developed under a sister project funded by NASA called the Applied Remote Sensing Training uh, and, and a few other uh, materials. So these are uh, recorded and coming with supplementary materials so you can uh, self, you know, learn at your own pace. And then, of course, uh, we're always welcome to uh, have people join. Uh, there's a, also a map of where people are based and a little short descriptions of people. You'll see some familiar faces here, I think. I'm, I'm somewhere here in the bottom. Um, uh, so that's kind of the main site. I don't, I guess we don't really have time for me to do any more demos. Um, one of the tools I'll just briefly mention I was going to go into, but isn't really time, is a tool that we've developed, uh, uh, which, which has, I think, uh, one nice feature I wanted to mention, which is this ability to uh, look at uh, four different spots, uh, I'm sorry, four different data sets at the same time in parallel. You can actually um, zoom in separately if you want um, and change. So you could look at four different cities. You could look at four different variables. You could look at four different points in time in, in a very uh, easy way. And uh, uh, there are some other tools where you can kind of estimate how many people live. One of the issues that uh, has started to come up is because there's so many different data sets, it's often hard for someone in a city to understand what is the most appropriate data set to use. And uh, this tool allows you to do some intercomparison and uh, see how different data sets might give you different results. Uh, uh, depending on the application. So I think I should probably go back to the slideshow just now. Buried here, yeah. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, so this actually just repeats that uh, uh, there is a webinar series available through RSET and uh, goes through some of these indicators in more detail if you're interested. Um, and I think I'll stop there and hopefully there's still time for the small groups and questions. Thank you so much, Bob and Julie for your uh, very informative and interesting presentation. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of tools and data sets and information available, uh, both on the toolkit platform and the EO for SDGs website for students to explore um, as they are working on their final projects. So as part of the summer program, 
uh, the students um, select uh, a topic related to uh, the summer theme, uh, and they use um, some of the new skills that they learn throughout the program. Uh, so we offer lessons, sometimes technical training on, on GIS uh, or um, lessons related to the SDGs and storytelling. Uh, so basically, all of the students are going to submit um, a story map. Um, featuring their final projects. So um, I think this will provide a lot of inspiration on uh, resources that students can, can uh, incorporate in the work that they're doing. So thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we do have time for our breakout sessions. So those are usually about five minutes. Um, so Tim is gonna go ahead and uh, assign us to um, a group, and then we'll come back in five minutes uh, in case there are any additional questions uh, or comments that students have for uh, any of our guest speakers. Thanks, Tim. of our story. Oh. Hi, sorry, I joined this one. It seems everyone had um, someone else in it. Maybe I, I don't know. How are your story maps going? And we was asking fellow, when is the last date for the story maps to be submitted? And I want to open up the document. I think it's not until like the third week of August, right? So I want to say third week of August or the 29th of August latest because that's uh, the last day to submit the story maps. All right. How is it going? Any challenges with that? Any suggestions on uh, this weekend's or uh, this, uh, this session's uh, discussion? Mm, not really, no. Which, which topics have we chosen? I'm still thinking of a topic. Uh, so the SDG I'm focusing on is climate action. Climate action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so basically focusing on which part of climate action? I'm yet to sort of like Hone uh, down. decide upon like, you know, a topic under climate action mm -hmm. uh, how do you suggest I go about it so see we are covering all these different topics last time right. was very fascinating also to hear about um, uh, cities resilient cities before that we did uh, um, the sound of those uh, the ships inside water so we did some ocean related um, work as well last time, last time so I think Use the topics that we are covering to see what are you interested in, and then maybe we can uh, that way you'll be able to see which is the action climate action you are most interested in. Right, Cooper. Mm -hmm. Any reflections from your end? How's the session been? Is it boring you? Is it exciting? Any suggestions?
How is everything over here? We're good. Good. How are you doing, Jim? I'm just popping into all the different breakout rooms just in case anyone needed. I think every <laughs> that room has a, a person with it, so I'm just moving around. Okay, cool. I'll, um, Dimitri, uh, you're just talking about um the email exchange about um the ArcGIS online settings and things like that. So we can connect right. after after this call. I definitely added. Well, Dimitri's added, and you should have publisher privileges with a hundred credits. So that's that's definitely uh done. But uh, whatever else you need, yeah, let me know. Okay. Was it different before or was it something you had to change? It was user before. So I just followed the um the okay. your recommendation your email so I changed from user to publisher and then I added the credit limit so that we didn't end up uh, accidentally eating into other people's projects. But um yeah. okay. that's, that's all I've done. So if, if there needs to be anything more, then I'm I'm ready for that. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm gonna probably close the groups in a bit. So if that's it. Okay, Dimitri, if um if you haven't tried it today, feel free to try it. And then if not, it'll be hard to come to a a, a consensus on um how those are gonna be measured. So so a very good question. Um and again, that you know has implications for what is going to be shown as the data set, what is going to be the reference point, right, to track progress. And that's really hard to do when there is no uh, very clear indicator set on a global level. Um, are we back in the main room? Uh, or... No, sorry. I'm just popping into the different groups in case anyone had any um, ah, great. user questions. Okay. Um, Someone in Anella's group had uh, something about the RJS licenses. So if anyone needs ah. any, um, I can pop in. That's, that's great. Thank you, Tim. Um, so while we have Tim here, um, does anyone have any questions regarding the Esri licenses or your projects? Uh, when should we start our projects? What should be, what's a good time frame to create our projects? Yeah. I mean, I, I think this one also depends maybe a little bit on how you work. I mean, I would say just to be on the safe side, the safe side, the earlier you can start, the better. Um, just because as you see, each week we're bringing in different speakers. Each week we're covering a different topic. So if you've already kind of gone into, even if it's not fully developed, if you've already started looking at, um, you know, the story maps, how you want to, um, how you want to scope out your project. It's just easier. You might be getting more inspiration or ideas each week based on even what your peers are asking, the different questions that are coming up. That could give you an um, a sense for, oh, maybe I should try to address this within my project. So I think the earlier you start, the better. I would say at least um, at this point, try to access the with the license into the, the platform and just check out the different features of the story maps so that you can also ask questions whenever we meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I know depending on the day, sometimes we don't um, always have that much time to go over our story map and project specific questions because of the presentations. Um, but you know that's something we can address during our office hours that are coming up too. So definitely have those questions ready and you will have those questions once you start you know, testing out your story map and your projects. Do uh, all, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, not to interrupt. I'm just going to be uh, sending this back into the uh, regular room, so that's all right. Uh, regarding office hours, are they happening right now or will they happen on the uh, penultimate week? Yeah, we're going, yeah, exactly. They're going to happen. Uh, So our breakout rooms are going to all close in about a few seconds. So people will probably start filtering in.
Welcome back, everyone. Okay, let's give everyone a few more moments. Okay, I think we have everyone back. Um, I'm gonna start with just mentioning that one of the questions that was raised in our group was about final projects um, and you know uh, the length of the project or what that might look like. Uh, so I'm gonna share a link in the chat where you can explore some of the um, uh, projects that were presented um, in previous programs, uh, just to give you an idea of um, how you can um, approach your final project and story map. So, um, you'll find the link to each year's uh, story map collection, which is basically a collection of everyone's final projects um, under each year's uh, program. So uh, let us know if you have any any other questions related to that. But um, are there any questions or comments uh, for Bob and Julie? any of the tools or data sets that were presented or the initiative and program overall, or if you might be curious on maybe how you can get involved in some of the work that, that we do. Feel free to share um, any comments or questions in the chat or uh, unmute yourself. I have a question maybe that could get us started. Oh, sure. so I had a question, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I was just wondering about, we spoke last week about urbanization and living in cities and um, someone mentioned that, that uh, population and, and, and infrastructure. So what is, um, what do these tools look like uh, in the face of, rapid urbanization or in like rapidly growing cities that maybe are overusing the resources that are available to them in their areas. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, try to address that. Uh, you know, I mentioned, uh, but didn't go into the issue of informal settlements and slums, which are clearly areas that, you know, people move into where they're definitely don't have access to the resources and they may be having, uh, you know, uh, stresses on the environment because of waste that's not managed properly and all those sorts of things. Um, and that's actually a, a, both a technical, I mean, it's an important social issue, but it's also a technical problem because satellites are not very good at sort of uh, uh, giving you accurate data on who's living in the slums, how many people, and under what conditions. And so there is actually a subgroup uh, that works on that particular question to try to link uh, different kinds of observations of slums with uh, sort of on-the-ground uh, uh, surveys and censuses where they're available, which, which is actually not very common. Uh, uh, but that that's really an important area because so many people, you know, are forced to live in these uh, these areas, and uh, there have been some community mapping efforts to try to pull uh, create better data. But uh, again, they're they're not nearly enough to kind of capture every slum around the world. Is that sort of what you were asking? Definitely. I also think Senna had a question about if there were any SDGs in particular that were more difficult to gather data on and why. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are a number that uh, uh, the international community is struggling with, and in particular, uh, uh, the Earth observation community maybe has less, uh, you know, capacity to deal with. They're not, uh, but you know, even even on some of the more difficult ones like measuring conflict and things, you can see where 
imagery and so forth has help, been helpful. Uh, another one is the education goal, but actually Miriam's been very involved in mapping, at least mapping the school locations, obviously collecting data about who's in the school, who's attending the school and, and such is not something you can generally observe from space. So, uh, uh, you know, most of the goals have, uh, have things that can be measured. Um, there's always the danger that you focus on the things that are easily measured as opposed to the most more important things that are hard to measure. Uh, uh, things like governance and collaboration and such, but uh, um, you know there are there is a pretty broad community to trying to tackle all the goals. So I think you know our community focused on remote sensing has to kind of figure out where we can be most useful. Thank you, Bob. Um, any last questions or comments? We have about a minute left, or I also wanted to ask Julia or Robert if you have any um, anything else you'd like to share with the students before we end the session. Well, I did want to throw out one caveat. Um, when I was preparing for the demo, I did notice a few uh, broken links in the uh, toolkit. So. I think Julie and her team are going to try to fix it, but, you know, apologies if you happen to hit a 404 not found, but hopefully it'll be fixed soon, <laughs> but it's inevitable with this kind of web website. And I'll just say um, good luck on all of your projects and we'll look forward to seeing those when they're done. Um, so best of luck. Yeah, and if you do use any of the resources from the center I run, which is called CDAC, and that's a socioeconomic data and application center, feel free to contact me. We are we actually have a user service office, so people who, who are waiting for, for questions and comments. So thank you. Thank you so much, Bob and Julie, for joining us today. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that our next session will be next Tuesday uh, on um, August 1st. So um, we'll see you then. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>